And what a perfect song to finish up the series of I once was. So who am I? I once was. But y'all are getting it. Eight weeks, you're getting it. There we go because, and you remember I gave you homework. If you were here last week, I gave you homework. Have you figured out your I once was? What were you once? Okay. I'm going to give you more homework. I know we're not finished yet, but I'm going to go ahead and give you more homework now. If you have figured out what your I once was is, tell somebody. Tell somebody what, what, what your I once was is. That's a little confusing. But it's your story of what God has done in your life. Your story is not the gospel. Your story is evidence of what he's done in your life. Make sure you tell that. So we're going to wrap up. <coughs> we're going to wrap up the series I once was, but Jesus. So we have talked about I once was blind. I once was deaf and mute. I once was an adulterer. And for those that had missed that one, because we give our love to someone other than Jesus. What are the others? I once was a leper. I once was possessed. I was lame. I once was. Have you figured out your once was? Here's the one that, that we're wrapping up on this one. This one to me is, is a lot of fun to think about because I once was dead. But Jesus. Now, don't get your mind all wrapped up in, 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 in some, in some off-the-road details. I don't want you chasing a rabbit. But I want you to do this. Turn to the book of John. We're going to go to chapter 11. This may be a familiar passage for some if you've been in church for any length of time. But John chapter 11, we're going to start with verse 38. Here's the situation. Let me, let me bring you up to where we are. Lazarus, his friend, brother of Mary and Martha, has died. And they sent for Jesus. So we're going to pick up that in verse 38. Then Jesus deeply moved again. If you'll go back up a few verses, you'll see one of the most powerful verses I think is around. But it's one of the most simple where it says, Jesus wept. Which to me shows the humanity of Jesus. And shows to me that Jesus knows what, he, he knows what we feel. He's experienced it. But we're going to pick up in 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this so that they may believe you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. Pray with me if you would. Fathers, we get into your word today. I pray that God, you speak loudly. God, I know that you speak with a still small voice, but sometimes, God, I think, I think that you can speak loudly, and I pray that you would do that in our hearts today. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, look at this whole situation. This is one of the situations to where I want to I make a point that when we look further down at the crucifixion, when Jesus was put in a tomb, they rolled a stone in front of it. That was not out of the ordinary. The out of the ordinary was that they put the seal on it so that nobody would move it. But here, Lazarus is in a tomb. And there is a stone in front of it. And Jesus starts out with, remove the stone. I love this because in one instance, Jesus says, remove the stone. The next time, he does it himself. And I think that's cool. But he says, remove the stone. And then Martha now, y'all remember Martha? Martha was the one that got mad at Mary. 
Martha's in the, in the, in the, basically, if you would, in the kitchen getting things ready. And she goes to the Lord and says, Lord, Mary, basically she's tattling going, hey, Jesus, Mary's sitting in there listening to you and I'm having to do all the work. Mary's paying, uh, Martha's paying attention to details. So what does Martha say? Martha's trying to help out uh, Jesus. He's been in there four days. He stinks. <laughs> now you got to realize, they didn't do embalming. They did spices. They would wrap the body. Have y'all ever looked to see or done any research on what they do with bodies? They would wrap them. They didn't just cover them with cloth. They wrapped them. And they put different layers of spices in between the wrappings to hopefully keep the smell down. Because you realize the rock rolled in front of it did not seal it. Now, for a short period of time, we lived in Arkansas. And we lived and I worked on my mother-in-law's farm. I'm not going to go real gross on you, but have y'all ever been around a dead animal? that has been dead for any length of time. After about three days, you kind of go, ooh. We used to use this term, something smelling ripe. And you kind of go, ooh, ew. I've had to go and take care of animals that were like that. Fortunately, I had a tractor that had a bucket on it, and I didn't have to hand dig it. It's like you dig a, dig a hole and put it in. But they start to smell. And that's with nothing on them. So you got Martha going, but Jesus, Really? Really? I'm going to draw some parallels here in just a minute, but I want us to keep going. Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? Now, if you look at that, Mary, Martha kind of looks back and, I mean, talking about it earlier on, she says, I know that we'll see glory when you, when you return. And I think Jesus is saying, yeah, but sometimes we're short-sighted. That we don't see the glory of God right now. Do you realize that if we open our eyes, we can see the glory of God? We just sang about the glory of God. And that we give God glory. When you sing and you praise Him and you give glory to God, you know what? Others see that. You know one of the reasons why we do congregational singing? is when you look and see somebody else singing. I know it's true for me. It encourages me and it builds me up. And I want to keep be a part of it. And it's like, oh, yeah, well, so, well I'm going to sing with you. I'm going to give glory to God. We're doing it together. And I can, when we're singing together, there are times that I will stop and just listen. I won't sing, but I will listen. Because I'm hearing the glory of God. I am experiencing the glory of God. And I think we have to realize that the glory of God is a here, now, and a future thing. Amen. And it's all encompassing. So I think Martha is looking and going, yeah, we're going to see it. But he's good. Jesus is going, no, no, you don't get it. And then he prays. Father, I thank you that you heard me. I read that and I looked at that and I thought, why wouldn't God hear Jesus? It's his son. Why wouldn't he hear him? And then that reminded me, as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, what are we considered? Sons. A father listens to his son. And I stop and go, oh, that encourages me to say, I can, I can talk to God and he hears me. And I can thank God that he hears me. But he says, I know that you always hear me because of the crowd standing here. I said this so they would believe that you sent me. And then Jesus makes that wonderful statement. Lazarus, come out. I had somebody ask this question one day. They said, what do you think would have happened if Jesus had just said, come out? <laughs> well, wouldn't that have thrown some people? Because they usually do tombs in, 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 in areas. Could you imagine Jesus walking out and saying, come out. And all of a sudden, all these people start coming out. He had to be specific. Do y'all remember the song we sang a while ago? Talking about death was arrested. He called my name. Jesus knows my name. 
When I placed my faith and trusted in Him, He called me out. He called me when I placed my faith and trust in Him. He did it. And so we see what's happening there. But I want you to look at this for just a second. Martha's statement when she said, He's dead. He's been dead for four days. He don't smell too good, Jesus. Does it almost sound like she's saying, Jesus, it's too late. Jesus, he already stinks. Jesus, the decay and, the, and all that starting to happen. Jesus, is too late. How many times have we looked at people that need Jesus and we within our hearts look at them and go, mm, it's too late. They're too far gone. Is that our prerogative to get to look at them and say they're too far gone? It's not my prerogative to look at somebody and go, well, they're too far gone and need Jesus. Too bad for them. If we put it in the terms of Martha, they're already gone. They're already stinking. They're decaying. Why, why, why put forth the effort? I'm going to ask you a question. This is rhetorical. Is there anybody that's not worth the effort to share Jesus Christ with? No. Because you're not the one that gets to determine how far gone they are. And you realize that there are other places in the New Testament where Jesus has raised, has raised people from the dead. This one, in matter of fact, there is one that he stopped a, uh, stopped a funeral procession and walked up and opened the casket and raised the young man out of there. And it's kind of like, oh, that would be creepy. I've been to too many funerals. That would be real odd. Well, if that happened, I'd give glory to God. Once I got back up off the floor. <laughs> or quit running and came back, you know, one of the two. But I want us to look and see that Martha looked and said, it's almost too late. It's almost, Jesus, it's, it, I don't think it'll work. What if God, what if somebody else's determination for us had swayed God's love? That somebody had looked at me and said, mm, he's too far gone. Forget it. Don't worry about it. It's too late. What if Jesus, somebody had said that about me and Jesus had gone, you know, you're right. You know, you're right. I'm just going to go ahead and weep and I'll mourn and, and we'll be okay. But Jesus goes, no, we're going to show you the glory of God. Because what can God do? Anything he wants. And so he takes somebody that is already starting to decay and says, hmm, you're not too far gone. And folks, here's one of the things I want us as believers to remember. We need to be able to look at people. Have you ever talked to, some, talked to somebody about salvation and they go, well, if you knew what I did, I'm probably too far gone. He's not. You want, I want to look at him and go, really? This man was decaying. Because folks, I want you to hear this. Hear this, please. The I once was dead was not physically, it's spiritually. Amen. It's spiritually that we are dead. Matter of fact, you want to see where that comes into place? Look, if you will, it's not listed back there, Sandy, so don't worry about it. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. When Paul, right into the church in Ephesus, he says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead. This is what we're talking about. I can actually look and I can say, I once was dead, but Jesus, because spiritually I was dead. Spiritually I was dead. And Jesus came in. Paul says it. I was dead. Do you see anywhere in there that says I was too far gone? Mm -mm. I wasn't too far gone. I was dead. But Jesus. And so Jesus calls him out. I want you to look now also. <clears> there is <throat> part of what applies to us. This message is not only for unbelievers. It's for believers too. Because trust me. I think there's some things in here. That we can look at. And figure out what's going on. If we look where at the very end. Where in verse 44. The dead man came out. Bound hand and foot with linen strips. And his face wrapped in cloth. 
He was bound. As we were talking a while ago, they wrap them and they don't loosely wrap them. Matter of fact, if you think about it, if you look at this crucifixion and at the burial, uh, talks about in, in some commentaries that I've read that typically they would bring about 50 to 75 pounds worth of spices. Plus the cloth to wrap them in. And you're going to wrap it fairly tightly. And I started thinking about that. When I ran track in in middle school and early high school. And I would have to tape my ankles. For support. Boy, I taped those bad boys. I had people that didn't run track. If you ever ran track or played football or whatever. And did any taping on your lower extremities. And guys would, would go in and we would shave. Because you pull some of that stuff off, baby. You got hair. Ooh, buddy. It's like I'd almost rather sprain my ankle than pull the hair off, off my ankles. It, so I had people laughing at me because I would shave from about right here down. Um, but I would wrap it tightly. It had to be tight. What good does it do if it's loose? So when they bury somebody, they're going to wrap them up real tightly. Now, get this in your mind. This guy comes out tightly bound, barely walking. And it's kind of like, well, first of all, his face is covered. How does he know where he's going? You know what I think he's going by? Jesus' voice. The voice of the Lord saying, come out. Come on. Here we go. That's another story. I'd love to have been a fly on the wall just to watch it. To watch the whole thing unfold. But then he says, unwrap him. Somebody had to help get him unwrapped. Somebody had to help him work through his burdens. Somebody had to help him work through the things that were keeping him bound. Folks, do you realize that that's what we need to be doing, not only with unbelievers, but with believers as well? That, folks, there are times that we get ourselves bound up. With a, with, a, with a new believer in Christ, I hope, hopefully you realize this. When Christ comes into somebody's life, their life doesn't always immediately go, boom, you're switched. They've got to get over the old habits. They've got to get past some things. They've got some baggage they're having to work with. Guess who gets to help them? Us. Notice that he didn't look at this guy. He did not look at Lazarus and say, Lazarus, unwrap yourself, buddy. He looked at somebody else and said, y'all, I'm going to do it Texan, y'all, help fix him, get him fixed up, get it taken off of him. He didn't look at the man and say, hey, take care of yourself, then then we're okay. He looked at others. Nowadays, if we look and we have people that are bound by all kinds of stuff, all kinds of sin, they come to Jesus Christ. Guess who gets to help them get it off? Have you figured it out yet? It's not a single person. It's an us. It's us. Jesus said to them, folks, in this context... We're the them. But you know the thing I love about this also? It's not limited to just the dead man. I think for us, we have things, like I said, that we wrap ourselves up in. We get wrapped up in something and we can't move. We can't see. We can't function correctly. And we've got to have somebody else to help unwrap it. I need you. Hopefully you realize that you need each other. Folks, the reason that we're here meeting together is not only to corporately worship our Heavenly Father, but as it says in Proverbs, man sharpens man as one man sharpens another as iron sharpens iron, that we're doing that, that we're helping each other. We're helping each other to shed the things that are binding us up, that are keeping us wrapped up. Think about this. If you'll look in Hebrews... Hebrews chapter 12, <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews actually tells us this. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, 
Let us lay aside or let us cast off every hindrance and sin that so easily ensnares or entangles us. And when you look at that and you look at the original language, it talks about that it wraps you up, that it keeps you from functioning the correct way. As believers in Jesus Christ, we need that. We need to start taking that stuff off that slows us down, that hinders us. I, can, I love it. Uh, I could hear my dad. None of us, well, I had one brother that played football, but was better in band, so he went to band instead of football. None of the others of us played football. Three of us ran track. One was in theater. I'll leave that there. Um, but I could hear my dad. We'd watch football. My dad loved to watch. Now, don't boo this one, okay? This was my dad. And so, dad would root for UT. Dad rooted for UT until, I mean, it was like, that's who dad rooted for. When UT would play Arkansas, oh, I was rooting for Arkansas all the way. Woo pig suey, yes. But dad would root for Texas, and he would sit and he would watch, and he'd go, I can tell you how. Dad, dad went to, to state in football. That's back when they wore leather helmets and no face mask, which when I think about it, explains a whole lot. Um, <laughs> but dad would look and go, I know how to take care of that. If they would just do this, he would say, you can't do a one-arm tackle. You can't grab the guy's jersey and try to drag him down. Dad would say, you know the best way to tackle him? Wrap his feet up. That's all, I mean, my dad would look and he would, when he watched the Cowboys, wrap up his feet, wrap up his feet. I heard that so much growing up. It's like, just wrap up his feet. If you'll just wrap up his feet, that's what I'm like, dad, what position did you play? He says, well, on offense, I was tailback. On defense, I was a linebacker. Thinking, wow, five, nine, 145 pounds soaking wet and you're a linebacker. That's great. But dad, dad had more tackles because dad would get in and what do we do? Wrap his feet up. You ain't going anywhere if somebody wraps your feet up. Hardest thing for me to do, little Maddox, okay? Maddox is our, our shortest, smallest grandchild. If Maddox goes over and he grabs both of your ankles, that little booger's strong. He grabs both ankles. I ain't going anywhere. I got to slowly go. But I, I got I to gotta, I gotta try to get loose. There was one day I was in my boots. I actually pulled one of my boots off, and I thought, okay, I've got one leg. And it was tough. And I stop, and I think, and I go, you know what? This is what it's talking about, taking off what entangles you. Could you imagine grave clothes? You know, there are some of us that I, I, I tend to, I, I hate to, to think back this way, but I think there are some of us that our grave clothes, when we came to Christ, we still have some of the grave, grave clothes left on us. That we haven't shed those grave clothes. We're still entangled with those grave clothes of going, okay, yeah, but look, my hands are free. My hands are free, but I can't go anywhere. Or maybe it is, I can walk all over the place, but my hands are bound. I can't do anything. Or maybe it's like Lazarus. He was not only bound with his hands and his feet, his face was covered. Well, God, I've got this. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. But I can't speak. I can't talk. And maybe we need to get to the point of going, you know what? We need this. Maybe we need somebody else to help us get this grave clothes off. Completely off. And don't let things entangle us. Because I once was dead. I once was dead. But now I'm alive. Because of Jesus. Think about this for a second. Do you know any dead people? Spiritually? You know any spiritually dead people? That you know that they're dead? Because you can look at them and tell, hmm, they're dead. It's kind of like when you look at somebody, I love this, and you can look at somebody that's pretending to be asleep and somebody that is asleep. You can tell the difference. Watch them breathe. I have actually, and I'm going to say it this way, I've actually been in churches before to where I can look out and I can see people sitting in the pews. 
And you can see some dead ones. Because they're playing the game. They're going through the motions. They're just saying, well, this is what I do. This is what my parents did, so this is what I do. This is what I do. I keep doing this. And if I keep doing this long enough, just because you're coming to church doesn't mean you know Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You may still be dead spiritually. Showing up to this building, you may be dead spiritually. And Jesus is at a point of calling your name and saying, Hey, come out of the grave. Come to me. Look at what I have got for you. I want to give you life. I find it interesting that if you turn back just a few pages to John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus is talking to a bunch of people. Now get me here. He's talking to a bunch of physically alive people. Okay? John 10.10 10 says this, A thief comes to steal, to only to steal, kill, or destroy. I have come so they may have what? Life. What? Life. life? What is the absence? What is the opposite of life? Yes. Which means we were dead. He came to give us life. He came to give us life. So, that's what I want to tell you. You may be somebody that's been sitting in here and you may have been, been in this church for years or maybe this is your first or second or third time and you're sitting there going, well, but this is what I do, right? If I come here, uh, that, that means I get my check boxes and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do to make it to heaven. Folks, the one thing that you can do to make it to heaven is place your faith and trust in Jesus. Amen. Declare Him as Lord and turn your life over to Him. That's what gets you to heaven. Simply coming to church, sitting in the pews, doesn't make you a Christian. Any more than walking out and sitting in your garage turns you into a car. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Think about that. It's like this. You can't just go into a classroom and sit there and not pay attention and not listen and expect to be a student. Jesus has got something for us. He's got something. And I want to make sure that, yeah, we're going to have folks that are going to show up to this place that don't know Jesus, that Jesus and they're searching. Matter of fact, you want to know that people are searching? Look at all the things that they're trying. I mean, the, you can run the gamut. Video games, all of this, everything else. Basically, one we didn't do was one, I was once an addict. We didn't talk about I once was an addict. If you're an addict, it could be anything. That you're trying to find something to fill that void that's inside of you that can only be filled by Jesus. Because we're dead. Spiritually dead. And He came to give us life. And I love it, John 10.10 10 says, not just life, but life more abundant. Which means beyond what you could ever imagine. And I love that. And I'm like, wow, there's so much more. We kind of talked about that. Salvation is a gift that keeps on giving. But here, we've got to realize that there are going to be times that, that we come across people that we might deem unreachable. We might deem they've gone too far. But Jesus, just like, like Sheila was singing in her song, who am I? He died for me. Regardless of my past, regardless of what I've done, He died for me. And I have the opportunity to be able to place my faith and trust in Him. And I can look back and say, I once was dead, but Jesus. And you realize that only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can do that. You look at John 10.10, 10, he says, I have come. I have come. Not we, not several, not this is an opportunity. It's like, I have come to give them life. Folks, we have the opportunity to share life. We can look at people and say, I once was dead. 
But Jesus, he came in, he cleansed me, he took care of all of the sin, he took care of, if you will, all of the decay, all of the disease, everything that sin had destroyed, and he restored it. I would love to, now this is going to sound weird, I would love to have seen a before and after picture of Lazarus. Before Jesus, I don't want it to sound gross, but before Jesus called him out, what condition was his body in? Four days in. Martha's going, uh, Jesus, he stinks. To when Jesus, when Lazarus walked out. Wow. Just look and go, oh, isn't that cool? That's what he can do for us. Because you think about all these other things. You had the leper who his arm was covered in white. Suddenly, it's cleansed. It's restored. And that's what Jesus can do. And folks, realize, even as believers in Jesus, we get ourselves stuck into places to where we need to be rescued. We need to be cleansed. We need that leprosy that we've stuck ourselves into to be cleansed. We need all of the the grave clothes that sometimes we wrap ourselves up in because of what we get involved with that we need to say the grave clothes needs to go because I need to be free. Because if you look at the way Jesus said this at the very last part, he says, unwrap him and let him go. Don't hold him back. Let him go. That's where we need to be. We need to be ready to go. Let him go. Let him go. And then let Jesus do what Jesus needs to do. I had a real, real crazy thing happen <clears throat> with Milo. With Trish being out, there are some days that it's been really cold or really raining. Milo is not a dog that does storms. As big as he is, he does not like storms. So I'll leave him in the back room. And I'll get home and I'll go back there and he's dancing. Here we go, here we go, here we go. And I'll open that back door and I can't get the back door open fast enough. Crazy thing is this. He runs out, turns right back around, comes right back in like, okay, dad. You didn't do anything, bud. He'll go out later. But he's like, I just want to be like, go. I just want that freedom. Hey, here I go. I mean, he's got couches to lay on. He can sleep. He's got his food. And it's like, but nope, here he goes. He wants out. That should be us, that we get the grave clothes removed from us, the things that we've entangled ourselves up with, and go, let him go. Here we go. We can have fun and see what Jesus wants to do. Because it's life and life more abundant. Can you say this? Can you say, I once was dead, but Jesus? Can you say that? Can you look into your life and say, I once was dead, but Jesus? If you're a believer and follower in Jesus Christ, I just took care of last week's homework for you. You now know at least one of what I was. How often do you get homework and somebody else takes care of it for you? Be excited about that one. You now have an I once was. I once was. I once was dead. I once was spiritually dead. But Jesus. Well, somebody said, well, what does that mean? Oh, guess what? You asked the question. Now I can answer. You started the conversation. And I can talk. And let me tell you. Because then I can go in and say, I was blind. But Jesus, because he opened my eyes so that I could see. As a believer, I've been an adulterer because I gave my my love to someone other than Jesus Christ. I placed everything on them and not on Jesus. And I've been forgiven for that. And I was this. But now because of Jesus, look at where I'm at. But Jesus... And that's where we need to be, is we need to be at that point of going, but Jesus, I once was dead, but Jesus. And is that not worth giving glory to God over? It should be. It should be. And that we can trust him. We can trust him. Here's the craziness. Do you think Jesus tarried for four days just because it's like, well, I got other things to do. Or he wanted wanted to show what he could do. He was showing out for our purpose, for our goodness, so that we could see the glory of God. Right then, right there. One of the things that I I would love to see, the glory of God, is somebody that anybody of us would look at and go, "Mm -hmm, they're too far gone, to walk in, place their faith and trust in Jesus and see what God does in their life. 
And that then we give glory to God. Because it's like, look what he wants to do. And that could be any one of us. So your new homework is this. You now know what your I once was, is. Who are you going to share it with? You might be at a point of saying, you know what? I've got some grave clothes I need to get off of. I need to get some things taken care of. Folks, this altar is open. You want to pray at your chairs. You pray at your chairs. You want to stand and pray. Whatever you need to do to do business with God, you do. If you're at a point of saying, I've been doing the thing of I've been coming to church. I've been doing this because I thought that coming to church got me into where I needed to be. And that gets me to heaven. Nope. Relationship with Jesus is what gets you to heaven. And if that's something you need to make a decision for today, come do that. I'll be standing down here. If you want to come talk about it, let's talk about it. If you want to talk later, I would love to. If there's somebody on Facebook that's watching, call me, text me, send me an email, send me a message, whatever. I would love to talk to you about it to explain how do you place your faith and trust in Jesus. Maybe you're at a point of saying, I need to be baptized because that's what Jesus says we should do. If you need to do that, come talk to me. We'll fill that baptistry up and we'll do it. As the outward expression to show people I've buried my old life. I've got a brand new life. Wow, I once was dead. Now I'm, because of Jesus, I'm alive. And I'm showing people. What decisions do you need to make today? What do you need to do? If you need somebody to pray with you, I'll pray with you. Find somebody else in here. There's other people in here that would love to pray with you. Whatever God is wanting to do in your life today, what decision do you need to make? Pray with me if you would. Father, as we come to this time, God, this time of commitment, I pray that, that if there's someone that needs to make a decision for you, that today is that day. God, if there's people that need to make, make decisions to, to cast off a, a grave clothes, if they need to get rid of some stuff that we've entangled ourselves with, that God, that that could be cast off. And Father, you, used, you showed us in, in this passage to where others can help us do that. God, if that's something that folks need to come and say, I need help with this. And Father, that's why you've put us together. God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that we can look and say, I once was dead, but Jesus, because of his death, his burial, but his resurrection, now that he's sitting at your right hand. God, that gives us that opportunity to place our faith and trust in him to have eternal life. Father, we love you. We worship you because you're worthy to be worshiped. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's worship some more.